Hello, and thank you for tuning into the tuning into the Druid's Rune. This podcast focuses on one Druid's voyage from being a novice to being a master of lore, right, and himself. Topics for our second show. This show continues the three-episode arc focusing on balance. This is going to be called The Second Side of Balance, Honoring the Feminine Energy. In the Druid Virtues section of the show, we are going to continue discussing balance, but in the way that it applies to progressing in our spiritual insight. In the State of Paganism section, we will discuss the proper honoring of women. In the Druid Theology section, we will discuss the Maiden Mother Crone Triad. In our Podly Blessing, we will share three blessings for the women in our lives. In our Ritual section, we will explore how effective Wise's use of imagery was on improving his health, and also share a ritual he devised for the consecration of the Mead and Cider. We are also adding a section to the podcast this time around, which we are going to call the Rune Errata, where Wise will quickly sum up any questions over how he put his foot in his mouth in previous podcasts. In the next show, Druid's Rune 3, The Unity of Balance, we will discuss ways to proper access, properly access the male and female energies in our lives. Hello again, and thanks for tuning in. Today we're going to examine the female energies and what many people refer to as goddess energy. But first, let me thank a couple of Druid's Rune friends. The first goes to Linda, who was our very first commentator post on our Facebook group. Thanks, Linda, for your post and your suggestions on how to make the podcast better. The second thank you goes to Gary and Ruth of the Celtic Myth Pod Show. Gary and Ruth, you have no idea how excited I was to see a post from you. The first podcast I ever heard was a Celtic Myth Podcast show, and it's what inspired me to think about doing this. It was a major inspiration in my choice to honor my Celtic ancestry as well. Your offer to play a bumper for this fledging podcast had me dancing. No, seriously, I was dancing. My wife has a video of it somewhere and giggled as I frolicked about the house. In this errata section, I'd also to thank Linda for, her, for Linda for her advice about how the first podcast sounded. She brought up a concern that when I was speaking of my experience with a few domineering pagan women, I may have communicated to the listener that I thought all women were like this. Let me ensure you that I fully understand that not all women are like those that treated me badly, and that, and that I honor and adore women for who they are. I'm sure that when this episode is done, it will be clear exactly how neat I believe women are. In other errata, I feel I need to clarify what I meant by sitting with the God segment. When I was speaking of an exchange between Loki and myself, I did not mean to imply that I hallucinated a red-haired stranger suddenly appearing at my fireside with a stein of ale and yelling, Yump and Yimini, how do you do? I see the gods of mythology as being parts of our own psyche that we have characterized. They may also be independent, disincarnate spirits, or they may be something in between. And the truth is, nobody really knows and nobody can really prove anything about it. So as a result, I think that when you're talking about the gods and the goddesses, the land whites, the spirits, the fae, the ancestors, you need to have a very open and fluid definition of what it is you're trying to interact with. So whenever I say I haven't experienced the god or goddess, I'm usually saying that I've gotten more attuned to those traits that the god represents my own being. I say usually because I do believe in them as separate beings. Sort of. Kind of. It's a little hard to define. Welcome to Druidry. That should be our motto. Druidry. It's a little hard to define. Because I do believe in gods and goddesses, land spirits, fairies, and elementals, I can be considered, from what I understand of modern psychology, as being insane. And I feel that's a great loss. I mean, you tell someone God told you something, they instinctively understand, oh, you mean you had this deep, intuitive knowing. And that's typically what I mean when I say the gods and the fairies and all this did this for me. But that's not how modern society views it. That tiny click you just heard, by the way, are the sounds of all the atheistic pagans turning off my podcast. Yeah, I know. I didn't think atheistic pagan was a demographic either, but apparently it is. I am well aware a lot of harm has been done in history by someone claiming God told me this, and then proceeding to tell other people how they behave, usually at sword point. However, it strikes me as funny how many times we overlook all the good has occurred by the same method. Gandhi, Buddha, Jesus, Lao Tzu, and all the other major prophets of our species— All did make improvements to their culture's time and place, and usually when things went awry, it's because of someone claiming to follow them, who never met them personally, doing things in that prophet or God's name they would usually find most uncool. Personally, I feel the only way to correct this is to follow the advice of the great prophets Bill and Ted. Be excellent to each other. This doesn't mean that I'm against all divine revelation. It's just that in my personal experience, when a divine revelation happens, it's personal, not communal. If you feel that we are, I feel that if we were to all approach the divine in the same way, we'd all be much better off also in our Druid's Rune Errata segment. It occurred to me that in the first episode, I forgot to tell everybody my name. (laughs) And so no one had an idea what to call me unless they went to the Facebook page. For sake of the podcast and for the sake of my internet presence, I'm going by the name Wise Thrice. Now this is a name that is actually kind of a play on words. When I first got started in magic, I was studying Hermetic Kabbalah. And in Hermetic Kabbalah, there's a figure called Hermes Trigamestus. And he is known as being thrice wise. Well, I tried to get thrice wise as my internet handle. 
Sadly, too many people already had it. So as a result, I decided to play around with the words, and I eventually came up with wise thrice, and hey, that one stuck. So that's what I'm going by. Do for safety reasons, and I do say the word safety reasons, I'm going to have to be somewhat anonymous on the podcast. I'm sorry, my listeners, I cannot tell you what city I'm in. I cannot tell you what state in the nation I'm in. I cannot tell you anything other than I'm somewhere in the continental United States. I have great admiration for people who either have the opportunity and the safety or just the plain I don't care what happens to me attitude to step out of the broom closet. Sadly, in my life situation right now, that is not a viable option. And so I have to have some anonymity for me and my wife. And not to mention our future family. No, we're not expecting yet, but just planning ahead. Okay, so that is most of our first Runerata segment. The last thing I'd like to ask is if you're an experienced podcaster, please send me notes on things you notice about the podcast that I could do better. As I was listening to the first episode, it occurred to me, I talk really fast and really erratically and not in a very organized manner. So I'm going to try to work on that in these first 25 episodes. These first 25 episodes are kind of my proving ground to figure out how the podcast should look, sound, and how it should feel. How much comedy there is, how much sarcasm, how much scholar, scholars, bleh, scholarmanship, that's not a word, how much scholarly um, language, how much scholarship, how much uh, meat. And then, you know, you got to have fluff because if you eat nothing but meat, you kind of miss the dessert. And the dessert's kind of cool. So we're going to try to make that happen. Please bear with me in my infancy as I find my sound and find how I want to make this work. With our first Rune Errata section done, let's move on to the second part of the Druid Virtue section that I began the arc on, balance. It is my opinion that Druidry's cardinal virtue, more than wisdom, more than power, more than harmony, more than peace, is balance. It is my belief that any religion, philosophy, or political system that exiles one of the human sexes to the status of second-class citizen is inherently anti-life. Women have been the victim of this kind of exclusion for most of recorded history. This unbalanced view of our species has been the cause of many of our current problems in the world. In the Western world, we have largely changed this condition from one of subservience to one of esteem, though there are still those throwbacks among us that wish to turn back amongst us that still wish to turn back the clock. I wonder if they were DNA tested, they would show more Neanderthal DNA than those of us who like things the way they currently are. I jest. Mostly. In politics, the universal suffrage movement gave women the vote. My wife happens to have a hand banner from one of her ancestors who participated in the marches and demonstration to give women the vote. In my schema, magic is closely tied to emotion and experiences and history. So when I held this banner the first time, the magical wallop that it packed from all the emotion and drama that happened around it was almost tangible to me. In philosophy, the inclusion of women into academia and professional circles has improved our science, medicine, and professional world. In religion, things are still a bit behind the times. Several branches of the monotheistic tree still exclude women from their clergy, clergy, and some even preach submission to the male of the household. The response to this kind of oppression in religion is commonly called the goddess movement. The goddess movement began picking up speed in the late 1970s, and it bloomed in the 80s and 90s. By the time Buffy the Vampire Slayer hit the airwaves, everyone knew what the word Wicca meant. Sadly, there have been many watered-down images of what it means to be a Wiccan in the media, and this is the major contributing factor to monotheists comparing pagans, heathens, and druids, and other polytheists to children that are playing games with, quote, god dolls, end quote. In our culture, the feminine has been de-emphasized. Though many people wish to blame Christianity for this, the truth is that the subjugation of women as a political and cultural phenomenon is largely the fault of Mediterranean cultures, such as the Greeks and Romans. A Roman wife was viewed as being property of her husband, and that this tone set the legal and social status for women for almost 2,000 years in the Western world. Goddess advocates are correct when they state that there was a time when women were held in higher esteem, though often these statements of total equality are fantasy. That being said, I can verify that amongst Celtic cultures, the status of women was far more equal than their Roman counterparts. So why did the loss of status occur? Why did the idea of suppressing the feminine energy take hold in our societies? I do not believe that it is because, like some have suggested, there is a part of male psychology that plots against women at every turn and seeks to keep them under male control. My own personal belief on this is that the feminine energy is not seen as being as dynamic as the male energy. The traits that we consider to be male are those of the action hero. They make for good storytelling and inspiring heroic action. The traits we consider feminine are perceived to be, by, are perceived to be a bore by comparison. What is overlooked is that the male energies are like fire and lightning. They are bright. They are light, giving the glorious... Um, they are bright. Oh, I'm sorry. They are bright, light-giving, and glorious, but they are also very short-lived. 
Male energy is limited in its lifespan. It's hard to keep in the constant state of action of the male energy going. Feminine energy is, is sustaining and nearly inexhaustible. It takes longer to achieve its goal, but usually this goal is permanently attained and can support itself. By contrast, the goals attained by male energies are either short-lived or cannot support themselves without feminine support. Think of the feminine side of the power as earth and water. These things are mighty and sustaining, and they work slowly. But compared to the fire and wind of the male energy, they are eternal. Approaching life without feminine power is like trying to ride a bicycle that has only one working wheel. So the above is poetic, but what does it mean? Let's talk about the maiden. The energy of the maiden is the energy that is like the seeds that have taken hold in the earth. It is a kind of ambient fertility that is being fostered, but it is not yet quite ready to bloom. It is carefree and playful, seeing what might develop and catch its attention. It is a level where we take in all things, not expecting to understand it all, but instead expecting to be pleased and allowed to play with the ideas. It is the energy of limitless potential and wonder. At this level of life, all things are a mystery and a joy. Society often looks down on this kind of energy, calling it silly or childlike. But I have to rebuff that idea with a quote from a very wise Jewish carpenter. Unless you become like children, you shall not see the kingdom of heaven. The maiden energy knows no hatred, no bias, no exclusion of any kind. It is open and loving and willing to accept someone just as they are. If you remember the first podcast, I talked about how the sun energy, the, um, I guess you could say youngest part of the male energy as I see it, is kind of hyperactive and needs to be directed. The maiden energy is not, I don't want to say it needs to be directed. It's more like, I should write this notes better, I'm sorry. It's more like I see it as, instead of a hyperactive seven-year-old, which is what I compared the male to, it's more like that charming, energetic, imaginative seven-year-old. It is that person that's willing to play with any possibility and be okay with whatever comes out. The lover. I have some problems calling this level the mother energy, as is the Wiccan way. I have a problem because not all women choose to be mothers, and by insisting that they do so seems somehow domineering to me. I'm not sure why I don't feel like that about the male side of things, having called the male energy the father, but I just do. This is the level of nurturing love. This is the level of energy we are now ready to take what we have been given and cause it to grow to its full effect. It is the level of power we can sustain others and give them the powers they need, not unlike a lover gives to us. We can feed effects that need to that yeah. We can feed the effects that need it and bring into being new ideas and power, not unlike a parent or a mother. Here are the things that met. Yeah, I apologize. I am trying to get within trying to get within my tablets. Uh, recording times and problems. Let me try that again. Here are the things that we here are the things that we meet are here. Yeah. <laughs> All right, note to self in my next Renorata section. Make sure I record things in smaller segments. <clears throat> Let me back up a bit. The mother is the level of power we sorry, the lover is the level of power we can sustain others and give them the powers they need, not unlike a lover. We can feed effects that need it and bring into being new ideas and power, not unlike a parent or a mother. Here the things that meet our deepest interests or needs in the maiden can become even more realized and given to others like gifts. This level is where people often run into trouble because they are given advice by others who cannot or will not understand their mission in life. Think of a friend who is always helping you by telling you how your life choices aren't what they would choose. This is also where people have a tendency to get possessive. Think how people marry themselves to a choice that might not be that might not be good for them, may even be bad for them, and refuse to give it up despite the evidence that they should. This thing I've created is mine and no one else's, even if they listened to me as I was developing it and gave me good advice. The good news is that this is also the level where all things can be healed. The soothing touch, comforting words, and romantic embrace of a lover are all appropriate images for this kind of energy that can be found inside ourselves. We can comfort those hurt parts of our soul and nurture them into becoming fully functional parts of our whole. Even our darkness we can love, and in the love allow it to stand side by side with parts of our light, those parts of ourselves that are fully realized already. There is a lot more that we can say about the lover. She is the basis for most of the, goddess of most of the goddesses of mythology. Sometimes motherly, sometimes seductive, sometimes tender, sometimes harsh. She is the apparent conflicting universe within us that if we just embrace it, we will see its inner harmony. The crone. As much as I dislike using the term mother, I have even more loathing for this term. I really don't like this word, but I can find few better replacements. Our language causes this word to have a very negative connotation that I abhor. I considered grandmother, but sadly our age our age has a culture I'm sorry, our culture has an age bias that also gets in the way. Queen perhaps might be a better word. That might be an acceptable alternative. 
This is the level of energy where we have seen how our project and actions have yielded reward or detriment. It is the level we are concerned with making sure that our projects and actions will live on into the far future. Where the lever corrects singly, the crone guides and ensures that new maidens will continue the journey. This often involves people other than ourselves and has tied into it concepts of the status of older people in society, from traditional societies, I mean. We have heard the demissive term old wives' tales in Western culture, but this term harkens back to before the advent of literacy and academia in our culture. Before such organized ways of passing on knowledge, the elders of a village or a clan act as a repository of all the experiences the clan had ever had. Such experience took time, hard work, and often involved loss. These are things that only a fully mature personality can appreciate. Compared to the quick method of a collective university, this elder method was deemed inefficient. Between the impatience of academia and the age bias that has crept into our culture, it was only a matter of time until the older feminine energy was shunned. As you can see, these levels of energy are not the reverse or the opposites of the male energy. They are different, and just as important as the male triad. The female triad, like the male, can be seen as the progression of a life cycle, and this is the common interpretation, particularly in Wicca. It can also be seen as representing time itself. Every living human being has both the male and female triad active in their lives, whether they see it or not. Suppressing these energies has resulted in cultures and personalities that are stunted and dysfunctional. Embracing them, knowing them, and being willing to, being willing to be challenged by them is the harmonious dance that we must all engage in to be real people, and not shadows of whom we were supposed to be. Now that's everything I had in my notes. Let me talk briefly off the cuff here. As I look back in the podcast from memory, I compared the father to being... If the son is hyperactive, I got to get it done, I got to get it done, I got to get it done energy. The father is how I will get it done, and the grandfather is how can I multiply what I did. The maiden isn't exactly the reverse of the son. It is much more a, hey, what can I do? And that's where I begin to see the differences in the two types of energy. One is not inferior to the other. Excuse me. One is not inferior to the other. They merely have different functions. And they're both just as important. So the maiden is exploratory energy. What new thing can I find? The mother, therefore, is from those new things that we found, what good things can we nurture that we want to add to our lives? And this is somewhat analogous to the father, since the father is focused on a single task of, hey, I had this action, this thing that had to get done. The mother is focused on, hey, we have all these new things. Which ones do we want to keep? Which ones can benefit us best? Now, just like the grandfather or the sage is the multiplying factor in the father's energy, the grandmother is the multiplying factor in the mother's energy. But whereas the grandfather is still, because it's, for lack of a better term, male, focused on one thing, the grandmother energy is more long-term, what habits, what things have bloom and shown results to be kept, and what things can I give to others that might foster a, I don't want to say deeper connection, that makes it more social than I see it, but would foster a more harmonious working relationship. And that could be with other people, it can be with other endeavors, it can be with other traditions or other forms of magic, it can be with other deeds, other events in our life. And so this is how I see the two energies being different. And you got to have them both. If you don't have all six of these working levels of power, you end up with no unity. And all it takes is one of them to be slightly off key, and you don't have any good sound. Another analogy I used once was, if you're familiar with a modern guitar, a modern guitar has six strings. And maybe that's where I actually got the idea of this. These six levels of, these six levels of energy as we use them in our daily lives... They have to be in tune, because if not, when you try to strike a chord, when you try to use energy from multiple levels all at the same time, the chord is not going to sound right. And as a result, if we take that to magical working, the magical spell won't work right. If we take that to personal relationships, the personal relationship won't work right, and you begin to see how it works, in my humble opinion, in my scheme of how I think of things. Okay, with that, let's go ahead and go to the Podly Blessing section. So I wrote three podly blessings for the first episode based on the men in our lives. These are three podly blessings for the women. And if you listen to the first episode, you know where I got my inspiration for it. It is my humble opinion that in modern American culture, women are not given enough um, self-actualizing messages. There are lots of messages that women get bombarded with by media about how they should look, how they should behave, how they should be, how they should treat others. 
but there are very little or very few messages that get to them that actually tell them about their worth just because they are. And so that was kind of my goal here when I wrote these three blessings. The first one, for the maiden, be without care or toil. Find what you love and cherish it. Bring laughter and joy. Don't be afraid to fall down. Be silly and romantic. Don't pout when I guide you along, but hold dear to this time and prepare to sing your own songs. I could see you saying this over your daughter. Um, I could see you saying this well over a friend. Um, although the guide thing kind of employs, kind of implies that it's someone related to you. Now I look at it. For the lover, we adore you. We honor you. With your love, you keep the world turning. When I am broken, you mend me. When I am hale, you add joy to my life. You care and water my dreams. You prune away my fears. You bear our wonders. I honor you, and I live in trust with you. That definitely has lots of romantic overtones, but I gotta admit, when I wrote it, I was thinking of my wife, so yeah, you know. For the crone, you know what? I really don't like that word. <laughs> I really don't like that word. Um, let's use for the queen. For the queen, your hair is white like a halo. You are steadfast like a rock. And the secrets of the past and the power of the future are yours to call and guide. Like the stars, you guide us, and we honor you, O keeper of our stories. And these are the three blessings that I came up with. Um, particularly that last one, I was actually thinking, not of a particular relative, but of a, um, I guess I could use the term elder. I was thinking of an elder person in the craft who was very instrumental in me opening my mind to more than just Hermetic Kabbalah. When I met her, she was very, open-minded is not the right word. She was very inclusive. She was she was well aware that her particular way of doing things was not the only way and that other ways could have validity and that maybe you have people that can walk between those two worlds and maybe you have people that are supposed to walk between those two worlds. Okay. So, um, I'm missing something here in my notes. What did I miss? Aha. I did not write my notes as well as I should have. I have my outline wrong. I need to fix that in the next episode. Okay. Ritual work. Maintaining a positive emotional state. Our lives are filled with stress. Often the stress comes from other people. Unable to deal with their own issues and matters, they try to pass the stress off to us, thinking that if we feel stressed, that someone somehow we can take their stress from them. This lesson resonated with me most strongly one day when I was shopping in the metaphysical shop of my hometown. A woman entered the shop, went up to the shop owner, and began chatting, loud enough for the entire store to hear her, about someone they both knew in common. Then the woman went on about her day, her woes, her television heroines, trials, and tribulations, how she hated when her husband did this thing that she hates, the government, how Republicans are out to dominate the female psyche, why she hates Bible thumpers, how asparagus gives her gas, how she is worried about her 10-year-old dog who isn't getting any younger or better. I really need to have a flipboard. She said she could only stay for a minute longer, and then she told the shopkeeper about her yoga class, how the instructor's a 20-something know-it-all bleach blonde she couldn't stand, how the health club was being unfair by raising its rates, which is unfortunate because her husband's job isn't bringing in the money like it used to, you know. The economy is so bad, you know. How she really wished she could get her hair done and the car repainted, how she wanted to go shopping sometime with her friend, the shop owner, as soon as they could get some time off. She was looking forward to a night of margaritas and girl talk. Okay, bye, ciao! I hope I painted that picture as correctly as it happened to me. Because as soon as she left the building and had driven off, the shop owner came up from behind the counter, got her husband, who was an eclectic shaman, to sage the entire store. And the store's patrons, every single one of us, applauded. I even saw one make the Catholic cross gesture and mutter a prayer to a saint. Most magical traditions have a ritual for protection. The hermetics often refer to this as the lesser banishing ritual of the pentagram, and some eclectic shamans I know burn sage around themselves, such as the shop owner, every day to create this protection. This protection is very important and cannot be oversighted, because this woman's example that I just cited earlier and above, who had so much in her mind and was trying to pass off her stress and trying to give it to anybody, happens daily, particularly in American culture. My own order has a thing they call the druid's egg, and it has been my experience that mages tend to see this protection only from aggressive magical effects, which was how the druid's egg was originally explained to me. But as I experimented with it, I found that the more I used it, the more other people's stress didn't bother me. I actually found myself at once very harshly judging them for having the stress, when they just so, simply couldn't get rid of it by staying still for a few seconds. And then remembered they weren't druids. 
or that um, particularly in case, not that they were necessarily Druids because they had nothing in their life that had ever trained them on how to deal with stress. In fact, in American culture, the only thing we see in TV on how to deal with stress that is American, that does not come from some other nation, um, for instance, yoga coming from India, martial arts coming from China and Japan, these things are often bandied about in the media as being stress-reducing. But the only thing I've ever seen that's uniquely American for reducing stress is drinking. How horrible is that that we've done that to ourselves? Okay, back to my point. It's been my experience that mages tend to see this protection as an aggre- only against aggressive magical effects. For example, some mage has a bad mood swing and accidentally causes magical ripples to affect others. Entities and thought forms that might be malicious or capricious are repulsed by, the, are repulsed by your LBRP. The LBRP is seen as protecting its misfortunes such as accidents or bad luck. Protection afforded by the LBRP should also be should also protect the mage from others attempting to influence his mind, or his mood, or his thoughts. I believe that this manipulation is very subtle and constant. It's kind of a societal chatter. Um, if you've seen Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, the original British production, or read the book, there's this scene where Adams talks about a culture that constantly talk, 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 because they were all telepathic, and the problem with being telepathic was that you constantly got everybody's thoughts all at once. So to disguise it, everybody kept talking, 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 broadcasting thoughts so that everybody had some privacy. American culture has pretty much come down that way too. We are constantly busy. We constantly spread our stress. If you ask someone how they're doing, they either lie politely or they give you a sob story. And almost always it gets back to stress. A culture that is ruled by tyranny has the problems of dominating the mind of such a mage. He is immune to a flock of sheep effect, or at least the maid should be. Often when someone, sorry, is trying to give us their stress, we make the mistake of letting them, making holes in our protection no matter how thoroughly we sage the room or ourselves. So I began thinking about my own practice and how I try to keep the problems of the world from affecting me. It occurs to me that the problems we face from stress are either from unexpected events or other people shifting the stress onto us, as I mentioned earlier. The first, unavoidable events and stimulus are unavoidable. I don't care how many waterfalls you've meditated under. When you are driving and someone almost hits your car and is going to cause an instant of stress. Against these stimuli, a moment of stress is the appropriate response for us. However, we tend to hold on to the event long after it has passed. We've all seen this in ourselves and our friends when something unfortunate or unexpected happens and we just cannot stop worrying about what we're going to do or that it happened. For instance, and I have permission to tell this story before anyone accuses me of not loving my wife. Once my wife almost started a fire in our apartment. It happened like this. She was cooking something and the pot's contents slid, causing the grease to catch fire. She managed to move the pot out onto the stove and away from anything that could have caught fire again, such as the top of the cupboard. But then she forgot what to do. I was asleep, wonderfully, blissfully asleep under my warm blankets on a winter's evening. I was suddenly awakened by my wife's voice asking me if I knew how to put out a grease fire. I didn't believe I had heard her correctly, so I said something very intelligent at like four in the morning, such as, uh, at which point she responded, there's a grease fire in the kitchen and I don't know what to do. I staggered into the kitchen to find that on our stove there was indeed a large roaring fire that was in danger of catching the roof of flame. Smoke already hung like a fog cloud underneath the ceiling of our apartment. All over around the kitchen, with a glance, we had no fire extinguishers within sight, no baking soda within view, but there was a large cover to a pot designed to hold a full turkey for basting. I grabbed this cover and threw the lid over the burning meal. I turned my wife, unfazed by the event. I then got a stepladder and turned off the smoke alarm, which was starting to go off, and opened the windows and doors and let the air out of the apartment. We spent two hours underneath the comforter, teeth chattering between sips of hot chocolate while the smoke vanished. I find this remarkably funny and romantic. My wife finds it less so. When I asked my wife why it had not occurred to her to smother the fire, she replied, I didn't know what to do. I've never had a grease fire happen to me before. This is a good summation of why the unexpected stresses hit us so hard. We feel out of sorts and caught by surprise. We have become complacent with the way things are, and when something goes awry, we do not know how to behave or feel. A little maiden energy here can solve a lot of this problem. By keeping an aware and appreciative mind, accepting everything as it happens, and not trying to hold on to it for too long, we can greatly reduce the stress we are given from the outside world. There's a movie scene that I like that is also enlightening about stress. In the movie Unleashed, there is a scene where a store is robbed. Everyone is panicked by the event of armed men entering the store and demanding money from the cashier, except for Jet Li's character, who is happily eating ice cream. When asked about it later, he replies, 
well, they weren't trying to hurt me. Now, although that's kind of an extreme form of self-inclusion, it pretty much sums up how stress is handled. The people that weren't directly being robbed in the store had something going on they were not used to. And so they freaked out and took part of that stress when they didn't need to, theoretically. And granted, if Armin broke into a store, I might be a bit agitated myself. But you get the idea. It's an extreme example, but it kind of gives the idea. People are going to try to give you stress. When something occurs that we witness, we allow our emotional state to become agitated rather and we allow our emotional yeah, let me repeat that. When something occurs that we witness and we allow our emotional state to become agitated rather than remain calm, the serenity is whoa. Okay, I apologize. I wrote that completely wrong. I'm gonna to have to start recording in smaller chunks. My apologies. When something occurs that we have witnessed that is stressful, and we allow our emotional state to become agitated rather than remain calm, we end up taking the stress into us and has negative side effects. The serenity is somewhat easier for those of us who practice martial arts as we know calm, untense movement is more effective than tense, stressed movement, and the same is true of mental responses. The only way to really protect ourselves from stress from the outside world is experience. When a baby cries after its, I'm sorry, when a baby cries after it's banged its toe, it's because to it, the pain is new and the babe is unsure how bad the injury is. To an adult, it is but an inconvenience, usually followed with some naughty words. The next kind of stress is that, our, is that of our own emotional swings. We've all seen the changes that occur in ourselves when we haven't had enough to eat. The first cup of coffee in the morning, or we woke up feeling like crap on toast. The body and mind are woven together, and one can affect the other. In our culture, there is a stigma against those who have chemical issues that affect their mood. People joke about someone who is acting bipolar when they have little understanding of how debilitating, sorry, debilitating and socially affecting the bipolar disorder actually is. Teenagers, teenagers are often criticized for being over-emotional by those far removed from when they were that age. A teen's world has so many changes occurring that each day has a, some kind of frightening adventure. Our culture also cartoons men like crises, when both men and women experience a turndown in energy and mood due to lost hormone levels. Women have the harder time of this in our culture, as our culture's over-sexualization of young women believes a woman in menopause to be used up. Hey, I recognize the problems we have in the West. This goes doubly for all the jokes I've ever heard about a woman's monthly cycle. I truly wish such puerile and adolescent humor would vanish. As that is not likely to happen, I guess that we'll have to endure it, or at least go on a massive um, effort to educate the public that these are not appropriate topics for humor. So what can we do? I believe a simple magical right to vent stress can be found in practices much like the one I'm about to outline. This is a practice. Uh, this practice is a thing I found myself doing about two years ago. It was partly by images of the Buddha sitting underneath the tree that a tree with a hand. Yeah. It was partly inspired by images of the Buddha sitting under a tree and placing one hand on the ground. In my magical cosmology, the deep earth is a place of intense transformation. Think of the mushroom that breaks things down, the earthworms that till the topsoil. Compost heaps laid in the earth become fertile soil. I use this image to handle all of my emotional junk. Whenever I am confronted with stress, such as from a person who is trying to give it to me or by unexpected events, I visualize the stress as dark brown light, which runs through my body, out of my palm, or down my hands or my feet into the earth. There in the deep earth, the stress remains and is changed by the earth into energy for my other endeavors. Thus, whenever stress is present, I am turning it into fuel for growth I will need later. I can use the same visualization for emotions and concerns I wish to change into healthier habits. For instance, before I met my wife, I had a run of very bad relationships. I mean, very bad relationships. The effect of so many harmful love affairs had done considerable damage to my self-esteem. It wasn't until I began placing my fears into the earth that I would be alone forever that things began changing for me. It wasn't an overnight transformation, but by the time my wife and met, I'd progressed out of the dumps far enough that I was no longer hating myself for the bad love affairs. She helped accelerate this growth and gave me evidence that I was a worthy person by the fact that she loved me. Okay, that's an awe moment. Aww. I love you, honey muffin. All right, back to the podcast. The practice seems simple, but it's actually kind of difficult to pull off when you really need it. Picture an irate customer is inside your personal safety bubble and is ranting about how you are responsible for their displeasure. Trying to channel this light into the deep earth might be a little hard to do at that moment. And speaking from personal experience, it is easier to react back. When I was a retail clerk, I mastered how to use sarcasm without the other person realizing I was doing it. This fine skill I recommend for all... Nah, I need to be a better person. Okay, on this one, no, I don't. This fine skill I recommend for every retail clerk, but use it sparingly. It might get you fired. I wasn't the most 
It was the most healthy choice, and looking back on it, I can see now it was the lesser of my moral choices. It still felt very good and therapeutic, though, and I'm still going to stand by it. That brings up something else about stress. Often the response we have to develop is a conditioned reflex. Someone calls us a name, and we name call them back. Someone honks us in traffic, and we give them the finger. A boss is disappointed with us, and we chew out our staff. All of these come from a single misconception. Namely, that the universe should be nicer to us than it is to other people. You see, down deep, most people aren't content with being equal. They want to be pampered and catered to. Why else do people complain loudly in restaurants about how the food isn't just right to their liking? I've seen many a steak or burger not cooked correctly. That was absolutely fine. And I guarantee you if I take that same steak or burger to someone in a starving country, they would find it just fine too. The solution should not involve yelling or bad language. It hardly ever turns out that way, however. We attach personal outrage to events that don't go our way. It's as if the universe has personally wronged us. It even shows up in our mythology. Think of all the problems that Hera causes for poor Hercules in the, pop in the popular television shows and in the Greek myths. He had nothing to do with them. He had no control over who Zeus was sleeping with. Yet Hera takes it out on him because she can't take it out on Zeus. We find it easier to blame someone for our problems, and we find it emotionally rewarding to express anger at them. And you know that this wasn't so. You wouldn't see so many people doing it. But by mastering the visualization I mentioned above, we can channel this anger into the deep earth and is transformed into proper energetic action. I've often heard people express outrage over political issues, for instance. When I ask them if they've written letters to the representatives, they seem aghast. What will that do? I'm often told. My outrage can't compete with the big interest groups who control everything. Often I meet this attitude with any problem someone is encountering. Anger in and of itself feels rewarding. It justifies itself just because it exists. And whenever I hear the complaint that things can't change or someone believes themselves not to be strong enough to change, I know that they are actually clinging to that reward of anger. So when dealing with our own personal emotions and the effect they have on our stressors of our lives, we need to become more aware of what we are feeling and why. We need to act appropriately, which is to say productively, to that emotional energy. When you are angry, you probably should be angry. When you are sad, you probably should be sad. When you are happy, you probably should be happy. When your computer erases your podcast, you know, the one you've been working on for a week and you've had to record twice now, you should feel frustrated and angry. You should not, however, throw the computer against the wall. Just saying. No personal experience there. Some forms of the Golden Dawn Descended Magical Systems have a rite called the IOB. This stands for Identify, Objectify, and Banish. You can find a good summation of the technique in Donald Michael Craig's Modern Magic. That's magic with a K on the end. Very important. Got to have the K on the end. It is another good magical rite for improving your character. By the way, later I'm going to share a rite I wrote because the IOB started not working for me. And I invented another one I called Identify... Um, reconcile. Oh, I gotta look at my notes, but it was something like I I R R O. Um, and it it was a long, complicated process, but essentially, it was a more integrative right than what I felt the IOB was. So, what does this have to do with the feminine energy? You ask. Well, and I'll get more on this in the third podcast, and I'll get into this deeper in the third arc of the podcast. Male and female energies have different problem-solving strategies. For instance, let's pretend you're a child at school. You're about ten or eleven years of age. The school bully is picking on you. You haven't told your parents because you know that, that will get you labeled as a fink. You sat there quietly enduring the abuse and trying to fit in. And then one day, the bully said something in front of the person you like. I don't just mean like, I mean like-like. And it makes you look foolish. Without missing a beat, you spin your rage behind a small balled-up fist and you slam the bully's jaw hard to the left. The bully blinks at you from the ground, cries, and then runs off. And somehow, everyone is blaming you for the incident. Hold on, guys. Uh, my notes are a little scattered here. I gotta get to one that printed off better. There we are. Sorry for the delay. So back to the small you who just clocked the bully in the jaw and everyone's blaming you. You get home. Your father is angry. Your father is only concerned about what you did. To him, you have hit another child without real cause. He sends you to your room and you flop on your bed feeling even more alone. Now your mother comes into the room. She lays a hand on your shoulder and asks you how you are feeling. You try to be strong in the silent type. It doesn't work. Soon you are crying your mother is holding you. You are soon spilling the beans about the long period of teasing and how you hate him. The bully that is. Your mother soothes your small ego and puts you to bed, promise you it's all going to be alright. And because she's your mother and she's never been wrong, you believe her. Notice the difference? Male energy is concerned with short-term immediate action. Female energy is concerned with long-term behavior and patterns. Your father cares about what you did. Your mother cares about what you might do in the future. 
and why you did what you did. Neither is better or more important than the other, and both are needed to navigate your life. And now for the next to last section of this podcast, a follow up on the report of the ritual things we used earlier and also the ritual section that didn't make the notes the first time I wrote them. I have this right in uh, my Druid practice, inspired by Celtic myth. I'm going to go into it first, then I'll give you a report on uh, how the imagery thing worked from the last episode. And again, here I'm speaking off the cuff. In Druid tradition, I should say Druid tradition, in Celtic mythology, there is a almost um, religious adoration of apples. Apples are kind of a symbol of immortality, um, the other world, the fairy kin. Um, you see this in some other European cultures. For instance, if I remember correctly, in uh, Viking mythology, Idun's um, things she cares for are shown, are shown as apples. They're what the gods have to eat to stay young in uh, Viking mythology. And I, for some reason, as a child, always had a love of apples. My parents thought it was kind of funny because we had orange and grapefruit trees in our yard, which my parents were all gaga over. They'd actually not lived in the area of the nation we live in where citrus is, uh, grows very well. They had lived in more northern climes and um, more mountainous climes, and so citrus just didn't grow there. And so for them, the grapefruit and the orange was like the bomb. But for me, apples were what did it. Now, we didn't have any apple trees. Um, I think we actually had lim yeah, we had lemon and lime trees too, now I think about it, and some grapevines. But whenever we get apples from the store, I'd want the apples. And my parents used to always tease me about this. You often hear in um, How I Came to Paganism stories, examples of how people see little things in their lives that were little clues to where they should be, and they didn't know what they were at the time. And I believe this apple thing was one of mine. It always bothered me when I grew up in my monotheistic tradition that Adam and Eve in the Judeo-Christian Bible are colloquially shown as having et an apple. It just never felt right to me. And I remember asking, well, why did the apple thing get started? And I discovered that it's actually a, most probably, an invention of Irish monks that were translating and illuminating texts. They already knew the Irish people were used to thinking of apples as being something special, so they made the fruit on the trees apples. And that's how we got it started. Okay, so back to my point. Um, so I have this right for apples and apple juice. What I do is I take apple cider. Um, you, if you were like more of a vana true or asa true person, you would probably use mead for this. And mead's a good Celtic substitute too, but I always just felt more akin to apple cider. The same right I'm about to say for apple cider could be used for mead. I use this for a libation when I give it to the gods. I also use it for whenever there's a moment in my rites where people have to drink. I usually use the apple cider because I might have people there that have alcohol issues. Um, several of the pagans I first started training with were actually recovering alcoholics, so we never used alcohol in the rites. Um, so it just felt like a better way to go. And what I do is I set up my grove, I set up my circle, and then in the center of the grove, where the power is believed in my tradition to be the strongest, well, I can't say the strongest, where the power normally is centered on the attention of the participants, I take a chalice, or a drinking horn, or whatever it is I got the meat, the uh, mead or apple cider in. And I go up, and I just very quietly, very softly, chant the names of the three druid worlds of a creation around the item as I trace my hands around it, or a wand, um, clockwise. I'll typically start by facing the north, because the cider is earthly. It, it comes from the earth. And so I'll face the north, and I'll start drawing the circles around the item at the north. I'll make one circle. Then I go a little bit out, draw a second circle, a little more out, and draw a third circle. And then I'll stay whatever um, litany or poetry I feel inspired. I'll ask whatever spirits I'm asking to bless the, bless the cider or the mead with their presence. In particular, if I'm giving it to a particular deity, I ask for that deity to accept it, and I put my energy into it. Um... I know some traditions would use the energy of the land to do this, but in my opinion, the energy of the land is already part of the gods. And so as a result, when we're giving them a gift, it needs to come from us. Anything we give to them needs to be from us. Now, I may have that theory and that feeling because of my Hermetic Kabbalistic training. Hermetic Kabbalah is very closely related to Judaism. And that's where I was studying Hermetic Kabbalah, was I was studying with a Jewish instructor. 
And as a result, because of Judaism's belief that modern sacrifice has to be personal in the form of fasting, in the form of doing without, or in the form of doing a service for God, I may have this feeling and this belief because of that initial training. So that may not be Celtic in origin. But as I look at it, it just seems like a really good modern idea. Because we really need to, in my humble opinion, repair that relationship with the gods. As much as I hear people talk about repairing a relationship with the land, we need to repair that relationship with the gods. Because they are our guides in how to relate to the land. In my own humble Druid opinion. <coughs> Excuse me, my voice is very hoarse. I'm doing this without any libation today. So after you make the three circles and you either dedicate it to a god or you give your power to it or you ask God to bless it for people to drink around the circle, at that point the cider or the mead is a empowered holy thing. At that point, I treat the vessel with a lot of reverence. I make sure that it's not going to spill because that'd be bad. And if there's any cider or mead left over, everybody's taking their drink and it's left over. I will take it to the north, because that's usually where I see it coming from, the power. I'll go to the northern gate, and I will say something along the lines of a, um, a gratitude. Um, there's a very popular podcast for Austin True called Raven, not Raven Radio. Raven Radio is the wrong one. Hold on. Ravencast. Ravencast is the one I'm thinking of. And the hosts of Ravencast have this blessing they recited from their kindred that I kind of started paraphrasing. And if you've ever listened to Ravencast, you know which one I'm talking about. Um, briefly, it goes something like, the gods gave this to the land. The land has given it to us. We give it back to the land that the land might give it back to the gods. And that's what I say. Now, that's not exactly what they phrased it. And by the way, if you've not listened to their podcast, I highly recommend you do so for a very enlightening view and also true and how they do things. Um, I like that. And so I kind of, I don't say appropriate, but I kind of modified it for what I feel is a more Celtic feel because their way of doing it is very much grounded in Asa true theology and Asa true worldview. And it didn't quite match how I feel from what I've read Celts viewed the world. There are a lot of similarities, by the way, between the old Celtic way of looking at the world and the old uh, Germanic slash Nordic way of looking at the world. And we have lots of evidence that much of what we consider Celtic today is interwoven with the Germanic and the Nordic simply because of Viking and Germanic invasions and intermarriage. But then again, much of what we consider Celtic today is very hard to pin down because a lot of people can just slap the name Celtic on their book and people consider it an authority of what's Celtic and what isn't. We'll get into that in another topic later about what should and shouldn't be considered Celtic. All right, so that's my right. And I find this very simple not a lot of props right to be very, very useful. I've used it to help dedicate circles. I've used it to help draw the border of a grove. I have used it to bring blessings to people. Uh, one of the best blessings I did with this, and it shows up in my work all the time, <clears throat> is I'll have this right go on where we dedicate the cider, and everybody will drink. And if there's one particular person who's having a really hard time, we will all put our energy onto the vessel that's being held, as well as channel energy from the gods and the land. And that person will drink it, and the act of drinking it is kind of a symbol of that energy is then going into them. And that's a very nice, safe, beautiful way to do that, in my own humble opinion. And if you wish to use that, please, by all means, go ahead. So that's my ritual, my ritual amendum for the um, podcast. I hope you all like it. I hope you get some use out of it. If you don't use it exactly, I hope it gives you some ideas of how to modify your rituals or add or take things away or whatever helps you on your exploration of the gods. And as I look at my notes now, we need to talk about past episode progress. So in the first episode, I discussed about how I invited Loki into a sitting in the gods ritual because I was having lots of health problems. And I went into how I was going to try to use imagery to improve my health. While I have mixed success, um, one of the things I needed was I needed to lose a lot of weight. My job is actually fairly physically active, and just by the fact that I do my job, it helps keep my weight under control. But the problem is I'd hit a plateau, and at my plateau, I was still a lot overweight where I need to be according to medical science. Because of this, I was feeling very, um, I don't want to say sensitive, but I was feeling very disrespected by certain people in my field 
who pointed out that I wasn't as in shape as them and that it reflected badly on the profession. So taking their advice to heart because their advice actually was born out of a good deal of concern for me. I went, okay, well, let's make another endeavor to lose weight. And I looked back at everything I'd done in the past to lose weight and nothing had worked. And it occurred to me, I had never used magic to try to lose weight. It had never occurred to me to do it. So I went, well, let's do that. Well, here's where we get into the mixed results thing. My weight is going down. It's going down a lot slower than I would like, but it's going down. And part of that came from my image of changing how I see myself as a person who's overweight and just never going to be underweight. I'm um, sorry, never be at a healthy weight. To a person who has that healthy weight already, I just need to make my body catch up to the image of my head. There's been some success with that. My weight is down. Not as much down as I would like, but it's down. And that's the first time that's ever happened. So we can put that in the check column. However, some of the other health issues were what was wrong with my ankle. And sadly, when I went to the doctor, the doctor diagnosed me some very serious foot problems on both my feet. So I've had to modify what I can and can't do. And needless to say, because I have these foot issues now, I had to modify what I was doing to try to lose weight. So now I have to modify not only what I'm doing to lose weight, I have to modify how I see the image to keep what's wrong with my feet from getting any worse, as well as following the doctor's advice. <coughs> Excuse me. So as I've been going about this now in the interim time of the two podcasts, I can say that I haven't noticed the problem getting any worse. Um, it used to be I was in a lot, I mean a lot of pain. Um, just sitting down would hurt. That's not there anymore. And I'm not sure if that was from following the doctor's advice or from my imagery. I know it was because my pain tolerance got any better because, well, frankly, I'm still a wuss. Um, I'm grossly allergic to pain. I don't like it. But um, it, I, I can't put it in the check column because it's not conclusive proof of it working. But at the same time, I don't feel like I put it in the minus column either. So let's make a three columns on our paper. and Rather than proof and no proof, let's put a thing in there for maybe. On the no proof side, I still am overweight. I'm not where I thought I would be. Now, whether that is just because it's taking more time than I thought and I had an unrealistic goal expectation of weight loss. And, and because it's not, I guess, an immediate, immediate gratification effect, I guess you could put that in the negative column. But at the same time, our culture teaches us that all problems should be solved instantly. And I've never believed that is so. So I'm uncomfortable putting that in the negative column. So that's what that is. And you can take that as proof or draw your own conclusions. I suppose if I were being as objective as possible, I'd say there's a check in all three columns. But at the same time, I lean more towards the positive simply because that gray area, if I view it positively, I'd be more inspired to make the positive happen. And the positive is happening. It's just happening very slowly. So there you go. Um, okay, sorry for the um there. As I look at my notes, it seems... So I was going to talk about the ritual section. Let's see, I talked about... Give me a second while I double-check everything. I talked about the cider right. I talked about how I see the three feminine levels of energy. Yeah, that looks like that's just about it for number two. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Down at the bottom of my um, imaging section. Uh, things to go in the positive column. As I said, my job is a physically active one, and the ankle has not healed as much as I would like. It hasn't gotten any worse. Um, I can report that I can now run on it with no pain, which I didn't used to be able to do. As I said, just sitting hurt. I can run on it now without pain. Sometimes it'll yelp at me or it'll pull, um, but it's not the constant pain I had before. And so between the doctor's advice and my imaging, I'm hoping this is actually working and doing it. I'm not sure if what I just said is counts as scientific proof of success, but it certainly feels like it emotionally. Now I just need to start imagining myself lifting 300 pounds with the agility of Conan the Barbarian. That should be fun. And that's it for episode two. Um, episode three, we will talk about the unity of balance as I see it, which is how your life is better when you're working both the feminine and the male current at the same time. How those two currents relate to the three currents of Druidry how when you use them together, you get the third current of Druidry. And um, I'll go into that on the podcast. I'm pretty sure I can go into that without any problems. 
Yeah, I'm pretty sure I am now that I say it out loud. I think what I might do is I might change um, the terminology just to make sure I don't offend anybody rather than call them what the symbols are. And Dre may call them things like active, reactive, and munition or synthesis, antithesis, thesis, antithesis, and synthesis like, he like Hegel does. And uh, we'll go from there. So sorry the podcast is a little scatterbrained, but it occurred to me that I had not gotten it done and it needed to get done. Thank you, Loki, for a swift kick in the ass. <laughs> and uh, you all were sitting there waiting or maybe thought I was pod fading. I'm not pod fading. I'm just very scattered right now. Uh, let's end the podcast with a couple of um, couple of questions. So the Facebook group right now has very few people. Linda, Ruth, and, Ruth and Gary from CPM. CPM. Sorry, CMP, Celtic Myth Pod Show. Ah! And um, I really like to get of course, more listeners, so please spread it by word of mouth if you like it. Tell them I need help, I need feedback, and that this is the innocent stages of this as it gets better as I train myself how to do this. It makes me wonder almost if you could make a college course on podcasting. You know that's a really good idea. I need to market that one. But um, other things I need is I need... Um, well, first, I appreciate your patience as I get to be a professional podcaster. Because right now I'm hearing myself, I'm hearing lots of ums and lots of breaks. I also need uh, recommendations on what you want to see in the show. As I look at my show notes, I look at possible topics for after the three-episode arc is over, and I see things like archetypes, how they apply to Druidry. Um, episode two, answering the question often labeled us by Christians, what have pagans ever done? Uh, three, being in the broom closet. Four, what is it the Smurfs have against Druids? In case you don't know, there's an episodes of the Smurfs where they make Druids the bad guy. Um, I'm just going to use that for how media portrays pagans in general. Uh, virtue section, um, various virtues, do episodes by various virtues that I consider vital for living like I'm doing here with balance. Um, being alone, quote, in the world of men, end quote. What it must feel like for other people, including myself, to be to have this feeling of alienation in a world full of people who aren't into the spiritual paths that we're into, how we relate to them, um, how we can talk to them, how what we choose to share with them, how we don't share with them. Oh, yeah. I see this note here that I definitely want to do at some point. Pointy ears and pixie dust. Honey, where's my hammer? Often I go to events and I see people running around with fake elf ears, fake fairy wings, and scattering pixie dust like Tinkerbell and... I feel that it has very negative um, effect on our image in the uh, world at large. I'm not the only one who feels this way, by the way, before you all start leveling pixie wands at me and trying to jinx me. Um, actually, these are another popular reference if you've read the novels, before you all start trying to pix me. I'm not the only one who feels this way. A very prominent pagan scholar, Brendan Cathbad Myers, feels almost exactly the same way, and he talks about it in his podcast... Uh, Standing Stone and Garden Gate. So, before you start sending me hate mails, please listen to us and see what our concerns are. Um, here's an episode I want to do at some point. Experiences with Missionaries. Subtitled, How Come There Is No Campus Crusade for Odin? Uh, number nine, Dreams and the Dreaming. Uh, what I think about thought forms. Ten, Why Druids Are for Fear. Yes, you heard me. Sorry, that's the sound of my tablet hitting the floor. Why Druids are for beer. Number 11. Druids equal wise guys. Wicca equal the wise. What actually is wisdom? Uh, another episode I have here. Fallible gods. A lot of pagans talk about how they would rather have a fallible god than the transcendent, omniscient god of Judeo-Christianity. Uh, 13. Knights of Renown. This is a concept um, from Arthurian myth. How the knights of the round table are considered to be knights of renown. What it means to be a knight in the modern world. Um, part of my druid journey is this thing I call the heroic life. And I really feel like if we're all trying to live the heroic life, the world would be a better place. And so that episode would kind of deal with that. Um, another episode, magic by songs and by sound. If you look at traditional sources of um, myth lore, a good example is the Kalevala from Fenland. You don't see people going out into the wilderness and drawing a circle, making a glyph, holding up a magic wand or dagger, and proclaiming peace to the four corners, or calling on the great four archangels of Hermeticism, yada, yada, yada. You just don't see that. What you see instead is you see a song 
being sung or sound being made or some kind of word being spoken. And so I want to do an episode on what they felt magic was like and also my own experimentation with using music and chants and sounds to make magic. And the last idea I have pinned here is um, going to be a very complicated one, it's kind of in the same vein. Yeah, I've got it labeled runes, oyum, symbols, and spell casting. Um, if you don't know what a rune is, a rune is a, and it's kind of where the show gets part of its name from, a rune is a phonic, uh, phonic, that's good. Is it phonic or phonetic? Probably phonetic. A phonetic glyph, usually from a Germanic culture, that represents a certain sound. Uh, the most famous of these are the Fuvark, and today they are used um, by some people for divination, for some people for making bind runes and magic happen, and by some people in the Asatru and Vantra communities to deride anyone who believes in magic. Um, rune magic in Asatru has a very take-it-or-leave-it kind of attitude. They don't really see it as being vital to being Asatru. You don't have to do runes to be an Asatru person. Consequently, there are um, I can't think of a proper term other than rune weavers. There are rune weavers who feel that in order to be Ostru Vantru, you must be a rune weaver. They feel that it's very linked. And it occurs to me that there are druids who pretty much believe you don't have to be into magic or even worship gods to be a druid. And there are druids who believe you have to be doing magic to do the same, that, that magic is the ritual act. And so the whole concept of what magic means to pagans should be a topic in the podcast at some point, as well as what we mean by the word. Um, if you say the word magic in a Wiccan circle, it means something very different than, you do, than when you're using it in a Thelemic setting. And if you say it in Thelema, it definitely means something different than when you're speaking in Kabbalah. So that all needs to be addressed at some point, particularly since my view on that particular topic is very in-depth. It was why I got started in paganism is because I wanted to do magic. And as I started looking at magic and what it implies about the world, I mean, if you believe that humans acting their will on something can create certain changes, there's a big moral thing there you just stepped into. And also a big philosophical thing you stepped into that makes it completely different than the mainline Judeo-Christian image of the world as being fully controlled by a transcendent deity. And so that needs to be an episode at some point too. And I bring that up here at the end of the policy because now I say it out loud. It occurs to me when we talk about the feminine and male energy and how to unite them. I am speaking in not only a very, in my opinion, juridic kind of way, but also a very Kabbalistic way, and that automatically means we're speaking in a magical way. And so I guess it'd be fair to say that when we talk about the male and female energies, we are talking about magic. We are talking about subtle energies that change the world around us in ways we have to be very attentive to see. Okay, so... I think that's everything. I'm sorry I rambled at the end, but again, I was just acting on the passion of it. I think probably by the time we hit episode like 10 or 11, I might have a bit more organization in how we're going to make this all work. I thank you for your patience and your feedback. I hope you enjoyed listening to The Druid's Rune as much as I enjoyed recording it for you, and I do hope that at some point I get to lift the horn in your honor. Live the heroic life. Good night.